Live in Corporate is brought to you by Doximity. Doximity is committed to fostering an inclusive and diverse work environment where differences are valued, practices are equitable, and employees experience a sense of belonging that allows them to bring their full, authentic selves daily. As medicine's largest network, there's an elevated level of responsibility to everything we do. We don't take that responsibility lightly and are committed to working towards a more equitable world inside and beyond our virtual office walls. So if you want to learn more about Doximity, go to your app store and type in D-O-X-I-M-I-T-Y. Again, that's D-O-X-I-M-I-T-Y. Good evening and happy Thursday. You know if it is Thursday night, it is time for the Access Point. We thank you for joining in and listening to us. We are Living Corporate, and this is the Access Point. Living Corporate is a digital media network consultancy focused on workplace diversity, equity, <clears throat> excuse me, and inclusion. Living Corporate centers and amplifies black and brown voices in the workplace through digital media production and business-to-business -business consulting. The network offers a variety of programming, including the Access Point. The Access Point is a weekly webinar focused on preparing black and brown aspiring and experienced professionals for the workforce by having the real nuanced talks they don't know they need. During each episode, we examine real challenges you face at work and offer expert advice on dealing with your organization, your boss, your co-workers, and your career. Here's a disclaimer. The thoughts and views expressed in tonight's discussion do not reflect the views of any organization in which the hosts are guests or guests may be affiliated. Hi, thank you for joining us again. I am Dr. Wendy M. Edmonds. I am a professor, author, and management consultant. And my area that I always love to talk about is toxic followership. Why do people follow bad people? I'm going to turn this over now to my awesome, awesome co-host, Dr. Lonnie. Are you there? I am. Thank you so much, Dr. Wendy. I love when we get to these days. Uh, I'm Dr. Lonnie Morris. I, too, am a management professor and consultant. I spend my time helping experienced professionals unpack all the challenges in organizations and for the one goal of making you hate your job less and making people act, well, two goals, and making people act better at work. I am so excited today because we have an incredible, incredible guest. Our guest tonight is Dr. Max Pence who is a business psychologist who works at the intersection of business, psychology, and technology. She is currently the managing partner of Kavora, helping clients address business and digital challenges to win the future. Prior to this role, she spent seven years in leadership roles at Google, where she led the conception, build, and launch of the digital skills program that is now known as Grow with Google. Her career spans 25 years on three continents across multiple sectors and in diverse functions. She's an MBA from Kellogg School of Management Northwestern and a PhD from Chicago School of Professional Psychology. Max Pence, welcome to the Access Point. Hi there. Welcome. Thanks, welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. Did I, did I get everything right? Because you are a force to be reckoned with. I want to make sure I, I, I got it all in. I think you're right on point. That, that works. <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate it so much. So today is an interesting topic, and there's so much that we're dealing with, and we're really going to focus tonight on sort of the career journey and what it means to reinvent yourself. So we, we really, we titled this Getting Unstuck and Quiet Quitting on Today's You, but I think when we, when I talk to our executive producer about this, this is really about how there's really no expectation that where you begin your career is where you might end that career. And that we're thinking about what does it mean to be you in the next role, how you evolve over time, how you evolve in the organization. And if the function that you're in begins to disconnect with you, how do you make the move to really satisfy that inner self and to move in, into that? So I want us to consider a few things as we begin this conversation. This week, we saw that we celebrated World Mental Health Day. 
and the World Health Organization came out with some new priorities that they want us all to consider. So there were four that deal with funding mental health, deal with understanding the skills associated with caregivers and people who experience it, something about listening to people with mental health conditioning. And there's one that's really important to what we're doing and how we frame our conversations about self-care and that the World Health Organization is really make, wanting people in all nations to analyze work practices to ensure healthier environments for employees and strong communities. So that's a good launching point for us today. So when we think about this idea of how what we experience in the workplace impacts self and who we are, what does it mean in that context to think about reinventing yourself? Max, why don't you start us off? Sure. Um, I think for me, I always go to the very first thing I think for ev for everyone, no matter what we're doing, I think is knowing yourself, right? So if you're thinking about reinvention, you have to know what you're reinventing, right? Um, and I, I find a lot of times when we struggle with kind of like discovering what's next for us, um, it's usually a reflection of the fact that we probably haven't done the work to understand who we are and what's important to us. Um, you know, that includes identifying, you know, what our core values are. Uh, it includes understanding sort of like what our sense of fairness or justice is, what makes a good life. Um, you'd be surprised, like a lot of people don't really know or can't really tell you uh, what a good life is for them, right? We all have this kind of like preconceived notions about success, right? Make a lot of money or work for certain organizations or, you know, have certain titles next to our names, but very few individuals that I encounter when we talk about work have actually done that exercise to determine for themselves what success is, right? So when you're at a crossroads in your career and you start to think about, you know, change in terms of industry or function or, you know, whatever kind of change, um, you have to understand, like, why you're making that change. And the only way you can really understand that, I think, is by really knowing who you are and what's important to you and what success is to you. Uh, is it money or is it freedom, right? Or is it um, having a sense of contributing to something bigger than yourself, right? Having that understanding will kind of help the process of uh, reinventing, reinventing yourself. Dr. Max, I, I absolutely agree with that because I think COVID gave us two, two and a half years to think about that. Mm -hmm. And that reinventing, and, and some, two and a half years yeah, plus, <laughs> plus some, to think about that, and reinventing ourselves doesn't always look like moving to another job, and that's what we found out in the workforce. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it meant I, I want to become an entrepreneur and work for myself. Yeah, and sometimes it's even how you show up in the current job. Oh, I apologize for it. Yeah, it, it, sometimes it's just how you show up in the current job, what you focus on within the current expectations or the current uh, role you're in. And so I love this. Let me tell you why this, this is so powerful for me, because the same day the World Health Organization came out with these guidelines for how we should think about mental health going forward and particularly focused on in the workplace, there's this other thing on the site, uh, zd.net, so z.net, uh, zednet.com, and they did a survey of remote workers who are being forced or at least required to come back into the office. And it's about a thousand people they talked to. And most of the people said, not on your life, right? I will quit this job. I will quite, I will openly, loudly quit you before I come back to the office regularly because of all the things to your point, Max, about how we now experience success or how we now live life that have changed in the pandemic. And so people are saying, look, I will suffer the consequences before I go back and do that. So part of this idea about reinventing is because maybe it's not just you that's changing, but the, we know the workplace is changing and organizations around us are changing. So how do we balance that when the space that's giving us compensation and that's giving us our work environment is pushing in a way that is not the way we want to go? Yeah, I think, I mean...
So this is tricky for me to answer because I, my company is fully remote. So we have employees in several countries and nobody's well, required to go to work for you. There we go. <laughs> uh, so it's actually, uh, you know, it's a benefit for us. We were able to hire very, relatively easy, easily because people want the, this flexibility. Um, but I do think, I, I I don't think we should place so much on um, employers filling our needs, right? Um, I think if you work for a company that requires you to physically be in an office um, and that doesn't align with uh, how you want to live, then you you got to do something else. I mean, I think it's as simple as that. I think a lot of people are actually happy to go back to the office. I know I know people that are you know happy to leave the house three three four days a week, right? So I, I don't know that it has to be either or. I yeah, I think it's it's a it's a question of what's what's important to you, and if you know having that flexibility and not you know having to show up at an office five days a week or even one day a week is that important to you, then you have a decision to make, right? I don't think we need to put that on on employers, right? Like I, you know, some some employers are going to stick, you know, they've 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 made the real estate investments, they're not going to let it go, all right, yeah, even if right. it's just that. And if they want you to show up, then you got to show up. And if it's not it's not going to work for you, then you got to find something else. I I don't feel like it's, I don't think it's necessary for us to insist that everybody is able to work from home, right? Some people that's not really their best. Um, I have employees that always leave the house to go work from a, a workspace because they just feel like they're more serious when they you know are sat at a desk and they. There's no distraction at home. Um, so different people have different situations at home, you know. So I, I think it's just a question of what's important to you and then finding work that aligns with that. Obviously, it's not so easy to change your job, but, you know, you kind of, you know, do, 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 do the time till you find something that really aligns. Sometimes it, it will take you a few months or maybe longer to find something that really aligns with what you want to do. But I think back to that, just like knowing exactly what's important to you and why it's important to you uh, will make the time and the effort you put into finding the right uh, situation for you for you uh, worth it. So do you think that, you know, the struggle is, you know, what is the struggle as to come back or not to come back? And do you think it's a compromise with the employers as well? There are some jobs where you must be in place, but what is the big compromise here? I, I'm, I'm a very huge advocate for agency, right? I think yeah. every individual should have complete um, control over their life in terms of, like, how they want to live, you know, what they do, where they do it. Um, and I feel like we put we put a lot of em- on employers to sort of, like, make those decisions for employees, right? Um, I think an employer can decide to run their business however they see fit, and then we can walk, right? As employees, we can say, that's not for me. Um, now, I may be speaking from a position of privilege, so I don't want to, you know, but I, I, I feel very strongly about that. And I've walked away from jobs even when I didn't know where the next paycheck was coming from. Because it was so important for me to uh, be in a place where I feel like, you know, this is where I want to spend a significant amount of my time during the day. Um, And so I don't know about, you know, like employers can try to work with employees and try to compromise. Yes. But at the end of the day, I don't want to I don't I would not put it, you know, the onus of my happiness on my employer. Right. At the end of the day, I got to decide what I need and, and make the steps to get what I need. And, right. you know, even in situations where you're required to come to work, because, I mean, I've I've had people, you know, I've worked with colleagues that are were working from home as far back as 2007. Right. So this is not a new thing. Um, and it's a negotiation that they make with the employer to say, you know, I have this family situation or, you know, um, and then they work out a situation that works for them. So that's still available, I imagine, even in a lot of these roles. Right. So I think it's the onus is on the individual to kind of figure out exactly what they want and why they want it. Um, and either try to get it where they currently are or try to find a place that gives them that. Yeah, and I was working from home even before 2007. Yeah, it's but, been over a decade for me. You know, it was it was situational, though. 
I think we're having some technical difficulties with that, Dr. Wendy. I heard you say something about it's situational. But I, but I think, let me pick up here. I think this is really important about giving agency to employees about it. Oh. Yeah, so giving agency to employees to make the decision for yourself. And I remember being offered really incredible roles to do great things and lead divisions and units and organizations and not really wanting to do that job. And part of it was because it was aligned with things I had done in the past and I sort of felt typecast and I didn't want to do those things anymore. And so to your point, Max, I would offer some type of negotiation about what the role can look like. So here are the things that really, really resonate with me that I'd like to do. And here's how I can add value to this space and to the organization and bring this and amplify this work here. Here are the things I can do because I have that experience and I'm competent in those areas. I don't really love it, but I'll do those things if you allow me to do this, right? And that mm -hmm. speaks to the idea of privilege that I was in a position and particularly with space, I mean, time in my career where I could make some of those calls. But as you said, and the employer gets to decide, thank you very much, Lonnie, that sounds really cool, but that's not what we want, which is basically what they said. Or, and I get to make a decision about that too, saying, hey, I can, we can create it in a way that works for us both or maybe not. Exactly. Yeah, I think I think that ownership and I think that, you know, it applies to every aspect of our lives. I just a lot of times when I see these debates about, you know, employer responsibility, it just feels like it spills too much into like ownership of our own decisions. And I, I feel like we 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 should be responsible for our lives. Right. Like regardless of, you know, the situ our situation, regardless of you know what the paycheck is, I feel like, you know, we, we should have that agency on determining sort of, you know, what we do with our time. It's our time and our life, right? It's not, at the end this of the day. my it's... time. Give me my time. Back. Right. Really yeah. Like, and time. you figure out what you want to do with it. <laughs> right. I actually yeah. spoke to a, um, a former student who was in a position, a dead-end position, brilliant, brilliant um, young woman. And it was not motivating her to come to work anymore it was just a mundane job and she decided to go after a leadership position and got the job and is so excited and really someone else saw that she had these qualities and so there were you know 20 percent of the people who said you know you're just fine we just love you she said but it was not it, it didn't do anything for her and I love the fact that she knew herself enough to know I don't want to do the rest of my my life <laughs> in this little office doing this same work over and over and over again that I have more to offer and that was what was really interesting is that she voiced her uh, concerns uh, to a mentor and who encouraged her to go after the job and she got it I'll tell that. you why that's amazing, because I feel like I'm having deja vu. I don't know how many times I've sat down and said, I don't want to have to do this same work over and over again for the rest of my life. That's a big conversation that I have pretty regularly in the mirror. So I'm glad you have somebody who, as Max said, had the agency to go and do that, because I know that it can be a challenge sort of working yourself up to it. But I've definitely taken that that stance often. Let's let's, let's, let's go ahead. No, I was just going to add to that. I, one thing I've seen in, I think, pretty much everywhere I've worked, um, either, you know, as an employee, manager, or running my own company, is that when people actually step up to say, you know what, this is what works for me, this doesn't work for me, a lot of times it actually works out, right? Um, when an employee comes to me and says... I like these aspects of my job. These other aspects I'm not excited about. I would prefer to do one, two, three, because I can see myself being X, Y, Z in five years. That's exciting to me as a manager, right? Because I'm seeing go. someone that's really thinking about their career, really thinking about how they can truly add value to the company you know, in a committed way. And I want to work with them because I want them to be successful. Um, and I've seen that across organizations, across levels. So a lot of times they really, again, back to us, 
to like take that step, right? And it's not enough to just go to your manager to say, I don't like this part of my job, but I like this part. And then what, right? You have to kind of like paint <laughs> right. a picture. Yeah. Like, like what, what, what does a good future for you at that company look like, right? And why is that of value to the company? And if you can craft that and, and have conversations around it, you'll be surprised, like, you know, how many, how many people actually want to work, work with you on that. I love that. And so it takes us into this idea of the value proposition in organizations, right? And so when I look at how value proposition, employee value proposition is defined, it's a little loosely around what summarize, something that summarizes what employees can expect to receive from an organization in exchange for the work they perform. It's very, very transactional. You will give you this in exchange for that. But I think there are a few things that are really significant around that. And so I was looking at, uh, what was it, Webology, and they had something that came out right at the beginning of, of this year. It says, hey, there's, there's a work environment with adequate infrastructure, safety, and leader. Safety and great leadership will lead to greater commitment from employees. Right? So if they perceive that in the value proposition, they'll stay longer. If you have organizations with high human values, such as transparency around practices and policies and procedures, that employees tend to experience higher well-being, so they stay longer, and that they have a higher morale, so they stay longer. And then, they, again, the, generally speaking, they commit. So when the value proposition is there to the things we're talking about here, when you're clear what you want and the exchange is right, then it can work out. And so even reinventing yourself and reimagining your role or your position in a way that still aligns you with the value proposition, then things can work. But that's not always the case. There are some people right now for whom the value proposition is changing. The organization is changing. It happens. We see it when leaders change, when managers change. All I've got day a, long. Yep. I've got a client whose company was just uh, taken over by someone else. They were acquired. And so, the whole culture of what's happening has changed. They got somebody else who just moved into a senior people role and is trying to change org culture. So when those things start to happen, what do we need to be aware of as we're looking to navigate reinventing ourselves or, cre or definitely creating a safe passage through this, tran this transition? I, I actually see when 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 an organization is changing, I think that's where the most opportunity is, right? For you to do something different, do something new. Totally um, agree. Yes. Yeah. So I, I think I think when you know, if management changes, or sometimes the focus of, of of the organization changes. A lot of times, what we struggle with is the anxiety around change, right? Not knowing what the outcomes would be, not knowing where things are going, and oftentimes leadership isn't as um, good at communicating or, or kind of like showing you that roadmap. So it leads to we a see lot that of all the time. <laughs> right. And then what happens is that people fill in the blanks. Right. So you have a lot of rumors going around and then people get all, you know, everybody's like sharing, sharing their anxieties yes. and making them worse. Yes. Right. Don't tell anybody, but I did. Exactly. Exactly. Did you know that this person did this? That's why. <laughs> oh, that was me. Um... I did. Yeah, it was me. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, it was me. Me. I did. I said, yeah, that was uh, me. Oh, I right, did. right, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I do think uh, I've actually been fortunate to thrive in similar situations because for me, it's like, okay, let's take a step back. What's what's the potential benefit here, right? Um, and I always have that perspective of like, how can this situation uh, work out for me, right? Um, a lot of times when you have a new leader, Helping them is one of the best things you can do, right? Uh, if it's someone close enough to you in terms of like their level or their role that you can actually have conversations with, you can share context with, um, you can share data with, like that's an opportunity to help somebody get into their new position, um, but also for you to really know what makes them tick and what's important to them so you can build a relationship that will potentially serve you, right? Um, so I think just looking for those opportunities to be of 
service or, you know, add value to that situation uh, could be really helpful versus kind of like trying to just like, you know, uh, stay steady when there's a lot of turmoil around. Like be part of the change and find opportunities to to help people within that that process. And it's also an opportunity um, if you have done the work up front to know that you want to, um, you have an understanding of the organization. Some people know their job. They don't Mm -hmm. really know the organization. When you have a thorough understanding of the organization, you really are marketable. And networking, because networking also allows people to know your skills and recommend that you be in, in, um, employed in other places, even if it's outside of the organization. Absolutely. Yes. I'm sorry, I was still on mute. So this, this is good, right? Because we're talking about the things you need to do to sort of build up to this and to be ready, right? And say, hey, opportunity is, is approaching. How do we do that? So there's something, uh, what, in time staffing, put out this list of 10 tips to advance your career uh, maybe a couple of months ago. And now I'll tell you, I'm going to read some of the things from the list and I don't necessarily agree with them. And it really is framing around advancing your career and knowing your worth. I think that's a really important part. Knowing your worth is around how we reinvent. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this list and then, my, and then I'll pose my question after that. So they say, all right, you need a positive attitude, to work hard, offer new ideas, ask questions, become a leader, give credits to others, communicate effectively, establish a career plan, ask for a raise, and keep your skills up to date, right? And so I think we're talking about a lot of that, but the list seems sort of stale to me. What is this really about? Uh, I think that's that's a basic list. I think it's a good list, right? Those are kind of like the, I would say, hygiene factors, right? Like those all make sense. The only thing I'll caution against there a little bit is this idea of positive attitude. Um, I think... I think sometimes we overdo this positivity thing where, like, you want to go into an office where, like... (laughs) I was was Um, on mute, but I was laughing. Right, because everybody who got the negative attitude is quiet quitting right now. That's what it is, right? What's that? Everybody with a negative attitude is quiet quitting right now. I hate this Right, right, but it doesn't have to be... It's like we place this judgment on people's real-life feelings and experiences, right? Like... There are days that you're not having a good day and why should you fake a smile? Like, it's okay to be polite, but not like, hee hee, oh, it's all perfect, right? Like, like we have to be real about, like, we're human and be real about being yourself and being human in, in whatever, you know, whatever environment you're in. I'll give you an example. Many years ago, I, I had a house fire. And the day after the fire, I had an important meeting to attend. So I, you know, run to this meeting and someone that was um, on on the call, uh, you know, by by video conference later commented that I wasn't looking happy on the call. And I was like, yeah, because everything I own just burnt. (laughs) Like, I'm not. It's it's, it's going to be very difficult to be smiling in that situation. Right. But like this whole thing, there was a whole conversation around it about positive attitude. And I was like, you know, there's we, we, we it's. We we can have a positive outlook, right? Without mm. saying everything is awesome, right? You can have a positive yeah. outlook yes. um, in terms of like where you're trying to go, what you're trying to do. Things are going to work out, yes. But it's okay, I think, to all agree that this very moment sucks. If it does, right? I think this that, that's the only one thing I'll kind of like push back against a little bit is. Positive outlook, yes. Everyday positivity, smiling, happy, cheerful. I don't know how realistic that is. Um, But the kinds of things I would add to a list like that or where I would say like these are more critical, at least in my experience, would be things like being very, very intentional. Um, I think there was something there about mapping out your career. But I think it's beyond your career. It's about your life and being very intentional about how the career plan and the job and all that stuff maps with your life? How does it map with your plans for your family? How does it map with your plans to do more in the community? Like it should be sort of part of like, you know, a plan that you've made for yourself that kind of like guides you towards your North star. Right. So it's not just about, because a lot of times people are obsessed with like climbing this 
career ladder, getting promoted. Um, but if you actually sit and think about it, not everybody should maybe go for that particular promotion because that would be time away from your kids. And you've always yeah. said the kids are the most important thing in your life, right? So, yeah. so I, I, I do think like being intentional versus just kind of like having this you know, blank paper career plan is, is important. Um, I think also finding sponsors wherever you find yourself. Like we talk about mentorship a lot, but I think for a lot of people, especially a lot of minorities in the workplace, you need people that are rooting for you. Sponsors. Right. Right. We like exactly. You need people that are not just like, Oh, you know, this is how you do the job, or this is how you get promoted. You need people that are in those rooms that you're not, that are fighting for you. Right. So finding those yeah. people are trying to navigate through the organization to find the people that are really are passionate about what you do and excited about you and can kind of speak for you when you're not there. I think that's critical. Um, I think also, uh, you know, it's good to it's good to know the company, understand sort of like different elements of things that are not necessarily your job. But I think it's really important also to shine at something, right? So it's it's easy mm. for people to say be an expert in something. Be, right? Yes, be be good at something, right? Like, oh, Lonnie, that's the guy that does X, right? Oh, he's so good at that, right? You don't want to let any other areas fall, but there should be something that you shine at. I would say that's I would say that's important. Um, what else? I think the skills are important, but don't neglect the, the soft skills, right? Like the, you mentioned when you did the networking, that's critical. Um, just, you know, communicating effectively, um, being consistent, being reliable. Like those things are so, just as important as knowing the hard skill stuff. People don't think so, but the soft skills are so important. Mm -hmm. They, they, you know, we don't hear much about that in developing that side either. Yeah. Well, and that's why we have these these conversations. There are a few things that you address, Max, that I want to talk about. I think this idea about a positive outlook is really important because the, the notion of positivity, I agree with you 100 percent, because sometimes the reason why I'm not smiling today, the reason why I've got this look on my face is because of this job. There's something that happened here that is making me angry, and it might be something that's that deals with inefficiency, might be something that deals mm -hmm. with uh, lack of co collaboration, might be something that deals with resources, might be something that deals with behind the scenes thing. We talk uh, here a lot about the challenges we face in dealing with managers and supervisors. It could be something I'm dealing with with my manager in terms of how things are communicated to me. You just mentioned when organizations are going through change, it is very rare that we get full communication about it. So there are lots of things that just emerge from me being at work and being in the space that keep me out of having a positive uh, attitude today in mm -hmm. this moment. But it doesn't mean that if I express that and I share my frustrations with that and how challenging it is and the issues it's creating for me and for my team and for my coworkers, it doesn't mean that I don't still have a positive outlook about the organization, about this unit, about this division, mm -hmm. about the work that we're doing ultimately, but I might just be challenged by the things that we're facing now. I think what's interesting about that that piece right there was that they were more concerned with the look on her face. Did anybody she's a reach black out? woman? You know right. that's what it is. Did did they did they reach out to see if was there something they could support you with, even if it was a personal text? Hey, um, is something going on? But that re that response, um, I don't see with a happy face is almost like the expectation of a step and fetch it. I'm just gonna go in there, you know, do you do do you did, didn't do the dance today. You didn't you didn't smile. It's that expectation as as opposed to the wellness side of that. Is there something yeah. I can do for you? I, I see that something may be going on. Can I help you? Yeah, I, mean, I definitely think the the being a black woman contributed for sure. I mean, I know it did because <laughs> there were other 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 things in a particular situation. <laughs> but but you know, a lot of people did reach out and were helpful. So I'm giving an example of one or two. You're always gonna have like you know you find you know working on a relationship with many people. There's gonna be different ways people respond to you. But you know, there's we all know there's that sort of like expectation that as a black woman you don't want to come across as threatening. So smiling, even when you're not in a good mood or even when things are not going well, is sort of like how you, I guess, deflate that. <laughs> and let's say we, we are not in any way incurred. That is not our role here to say to reinvent that. We are we are standing beside you and in front of you for authenticity. We are not saying to anyone to, to downplay that. 
what we're saying is all this other stuff that deals with work, we can address that. So I, mm-hmm. I like this and that the idea about that, Dr. Wendy, is really important, that people are holding on to or latching on to things that are outside of what's really happening. So I saw this thing on, uh, what is this, the Job Network, and they do a lot of sort of career papers and things to think about. And they, they have this uh, article about the reasons you aren't reaching your full potential at work, right? And those things can contribute to what we're talking about here and navigating the space and figuring out how to reemerge after a change or a transition or just because things aren't working out the way you want it. And they've got it's a short list here. And, and, and there's one I want to really del- delve into and say, hey, it's just a might not be a good fit. We've addressed that in some ways here saying, hey, the organization is changing. Maybe it's time for you to change. There's some things happening. You can move differently. There might be an external issue, which what you just mentioned, Max, hey, something happened at home. My house burned down. So I can't be here. I'm not all the way here. I'm here because I support what's happening. And this is sort of my distraction, but my mind is somewhere else. And here's the one I love. And I know, uh, Dr. Wendy, you're going to jump right in on this one. That something toxic is at play. There's a reason we can't reinvent. There's a reason why we can't launch because something toxic is at play and work. Is that so? It is so. There, there are barriers that we walk into every day, especially as ev- black women, right? This is what we see every day. And you're expected to, to just deal with it. When it comes to reinventing yourself and you see those barriers, you have decisions that you're, you're, you're going to make. And you have to really think that through. You have to take that time out to think that through as to uh, do I stay? When you look at the change in the organizations, I have been through many organizations that have been swallowed up by other companies. Um, I have been through those that you walk in and they have they, they give you your check and tell you go cash it. They file chapter 11 at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> you better hurry up to the bank. <laughs> Oh, Dr. Wendy, I think we lost your audio again. Max, you want to jump in? Uh, sure, what's the question here? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, we're talking about what are those things that are toxic at play in the workplace that might prevent you from being able to relaunch and reinvent yourself? Hmm. I don't know. I feel like I've kind of, you know, I've been, it's going on five years, um, you know, not being an employee. And I've had time to sort of reflect on my role in those 20 plus years of being an employee and how I could have done things a little bit differently or better. Um, And I don't know that if in my experience I go back, I would assign anything the label toxic. I think I think it's just it just comes down to some things are not for you. And if, if an environment is not yeah. for you, then then don't be there. You know, like I, because when I look back at like teams that I, I thought at the time were toxic, people, there were people there that thrived there. So it was for yeah. them. It just wasn't yeah. for me. Mm. Right. So, so that's kind of how I think about it now. I think I, 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 I don't know. I don't think, you know, different, you know, different strokes, different folks, you know. I love uh, that. So, yeah. So I think if it's just, if, if it feels toxic to you, then you shouldn't be there it's just not for you that's that, that's as simple as i as i see it and i tell my employees now all the time i'm like you know if you don't feel this is the right place for you i will work with you to find something else like it's it's not for everyone the the way a team works or the way a team looks at you know whatever product services is not for everyone you, you kind of like find almost like you find your tribe and if, if this is not your tribe then you got to go where you're celebrated and where where you you feel like you can actually contribute something without I, giving too much of yourself or losing yourself. I think in a toxic environment, too, is how much are, of that are you going to take? Does it line up with your values? Once you evaluate that and you decide whether or not you can make it, because sometimes you can outweigh the toxicity. You can, like you said, there were some people that just thrived in it and they did well. And some people will do that. But I think that you have some decisions to make. And how long, how long are you going to put up with it? When those barriers show up and they can show up thick, how long are you going to put up with that? 
Mm. Yeah, I think, I mean, the other thing I would say is barriers are part of life, right? Um, Come on with the word. Right? Like, <laughs> you know, I, I kind of like, it's so interesting to me these days when I see like, you know, oh, that was hard. That's not for me. You know, like, yeah, life is hard, right? And the workplace is going to have hard days and hard teams or people that are more difficult to deal with than you're used to. But every one of those things, there, there, there is an opportunity to grow, right? There's an opportunity to learn about yourself, learn a different way of doing things, um, try different things to kind of like learn like what works in different situations. Like, I feel like there's so many opportunities in situations that are not necessarily what we would have preferred. That's why I personally, this is a very personal thing. I don't like putting labels on things because I feel like once we put that label, it, it gets in the way of the potential for that situation to help us grow, right? So if I say this is bad or this is toxic or this is not for me, then I'm, I shut down. Then I'm not giving myself the opportunity to try a different way. Um, but then to your point, yes, I mean, if, if I try, like I've, I've had situations where I try to make things work a certain way and I try different ways and it's not working and I have to say, okay, this is not, this is not going to work. It's not for me. It's time to go. And, and that's the decision you make at that point. But but I don't think this sort of like idea of like I'm protecting my peace and just walking away from things is I, I don't know. <laughs> sorry, I like like I'm just I, I see that so much these days that I'm like, peace is great, but nobody's gonna have 70 years of peace in their life. Like you're gonna have some hard times. If I can get two days of peace out of the week, I'm all right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, and hard times make you a stronger, better person. You just have to know, like Dr. Wendy said, when it's time for you in a particular situation to maybe go try something else. But I feel like we, we, we should give things a shot, right? Like we shouldn't quit too early or like give up too early or just determine so quickly that something is not for us. It might not be ideal, but there would be some opportunities for growth there, I think. Especially with leadership. So when don't, We lose your audio again, Dr. Wendy. I think we have a bad a bad connection. We want to hear this because you, you left us right on, on leadership. All right. So let's let's try this. We're gonna try this and then when Dr. Wendy, when your audio comes back, you jump right in with us. So I wanna I wanna sort of go into this this idea that there are some people out there who aren't really clear that they need to reinvent, maybe aren't looking at it and don't recognize that they might be in a place where they're stuck. They might feel a little bit, but they don't know what to call it. They don't know how to articulate it properly. So I saw this um, piece on IdeaPod uh, probably about a month ago. And it's interesting. It says, here are the signs to tell you that you're in a career rut. And it's another one of these sort of generic lists, right? But I think there's at least one thing here that stands out to me. So I'm going to tell you what it says. <laughs> One thing is if every day at work sucks. There you go. Second is if you have little to no autonomy in your job. Third, you spend a lot of time envisioning a better situation. So sort of an oasis of a career. Your career doesn't align with your, doesn't align with your talents. So the job you're in doesn't align with where you're strong. You haven't been compensated properly or you know you're not being compensated with what you're worth. You get little recognition for your work. You have a disdain for your boss. And I think all these things sort of point to what Dr. Wendy's been talking about, sort of when things at least begin to feel toxic, even if, Max, what you're saying is it may not be toxic. It might not be a good fit. Uh, this one, I think, is pretty clear if you hate your job. And this last one is the one that I want us to, to tap into. It says... You live constantly in the past or in the future. And so I want to let you both react to that. But I want to say, because like, I've, I've experienced those moments when I wasn't necessarily in a rut. Maybe it was. Maybe, again, I didn't really articulate it that way. But I knew that it didn't feel right. I was competent and I was successful, but I wasn't totally fulfilled. And I had difficulty identifying myself with the role and the organization. So I would often speak about the things I used to do or what my career was like then 
or roles I used to play because that's when I felt more fulfilled. So mm. I didn't. So I knew there was a disconnect, and it wasn't anything toxic necessarily. It just it wasn't meeting the expectations, or maybe just the fulfillment that I needed professionally. So mm. how do we how do we help people get through that part? When I I mean I think that's comes with i'm assuming you can let me know if you guys have had these these situations but i i've I've kind of like assessed myself and i feel like every seven ish years i go into like existential crisis mode right (laughs) um where where i start to think about like what am i doing in my life is this the right thing blah blah um but it usually starts from outside right i think a lot of times when there's stuff going on inside because we're not really good at labeling things inside. We put it on outside. It's like, you're angry. Somebody's making me angry versus why am I actually really feeling this way? Right. Um, and I, I think I'm just thinking back to the times of, I've had, I mean, I had in fact one situation many years ago, this was like, I think late nineties where there was a book I bought back then that I think it was called getting on stock or something like that. I remember mm. buying a book about being stuck because I mm-hmm. felt that's exactly how I felt. Mm. Um, and I think it was, I think I no, I remember I bought another book called escape from cubicle nation. Cause I was like, it was a cubicle <laughs> thing. The cubicle thing was driving me crazy. Yeah, like every time yeah. I like got to work and like got to like my floor and saw my cube, I just felt depressed. Right. Like I just felt like, <laughs> what is this? Like, this is not how to, you know, so I remember reading that book escape from cubicle cubicle nation it turns out what i was trying to escape for was not really that it was just i was looking for freedom right like i just wanted to Mm. um but i had to do the exercise to like over years right i mean i didn't get the answer right away but i think just getting really good at asking myself why i'm feeling what i'm feeling because i think a lot of times we might externalize something that's going on within us so i really hate my boss is relatively easy because you feel like they're the one making you do these things. But if you sit down and really think about it, it might not really be about them. It might actually be about what's going on with you and where you are and where you thought you would be. Right. A lot of times we don't look back at that. Right. So even when we're kids or like when we're in high school or or college, we have these ideas about where we're going to go and what we're going to do with our lives. And when there's a disconnect, a lot of times we feel down about it, but we can't tie it to like what that little girl or little boy used to want to do. Right. And so a lot of, I, I think going back and just like thinking through like objectively as much as you can, why you're feeling a certain way is really important. I, I think, I mean, at the end of the day, if it comes down to like everything else is great and like this boss just sucks, then hey, it's time to find another boss. Like, you know, but, but, <laughs> but I won't. I think what I'm learning now and, you know, I think the last few years is I don't, I don't listen to the first reason my brain tells me um, or gives me for something going on. I kind of like really try to think about it because a lot of times it's just a reflection of like something else or where you're at um, or what you need that, you know, you have needs that you're not meeting because you've neglected them. Like sometimes it's like, we look to the job to give us so much um, that it's something almost unfair on a job sometimes, right? Mm-hmm. Like unfair um, expectations. Yes, because it's like you have you you could have okay you could have a artistic talent let's say right like you could be a great singer a great painter and maybe you always wanted to be a singer or painter but somehow you found yourself in this cubicle, um, and maybe it's just completely unrealistic for you to like quit and go you know start trying to find gigs now but you can find a way to like express that express that artistic talent right express like the things that used to make you happy while you're still at the job and you find i think a lot of times when you find those things and you kind of connect with those things again you 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 it, it helps at the job um so i hope that answered your question but i think it's just it's I, I like to think this thing's are a little bit broader than just the job. I, I think it's a lot of times usually just the it's a reflection that it's time to like, you know, take a take a look in words and just kind of think again about, you know. And also like what, what great looks like. So if this current situation is not great, what does great look like? Like to learning your learning to your point, like if you're thinking about the past or dreaming about the future, what is it about the past that was great that you miss, right? Or what is it about the future, the possibilities that's ex- that's exciting to you? And can you map your way towards that, right? Um, yeah. while still being at, at this, you know, potentially unfulfilling job. You just spoke a word to me right there that the 
setting realistic expectations and that the outward challenges might just be symptoms of something that's different and you need to figure out what these are symptoms of, right? That there's something mm-hmm. holistic that's happening and you can't just keep pointing the finger. Dr. Wendy, you got audio back? I have audio back, but I, I, I couldn't hear. I lost sound, so I don't know where oh, we are. Well, everything we said was about you. We said you are toxic. <laughs> everything at work is your fault. <laughs> well, one of, <laughs> what I wanted to, to say is that, yeah, what I wanted to, to say is that sometimes feeling uncomfortable um, takes a minute and not to necessarily run from it. I like what Dr. Max said about how that helps you to grow. But think of this from an organizational standpoint. When you have a, a toxic environment, and it could just be a group, it could just be a group of people, not necessarily everybody you know, on, on that floor, everybody in that department, um, everybody on that team, but it could be an, enough with just a few toxic people that become the ones with the ultimate power um, and create fear. And if you are ever put in that situation, kind of sit back and think about why you're there. And I say that because I um, spoke to a client and that actually happened and she was not happy at all. She wasn't happy about being in that environment, knowing, went in knowing that this group is awful. But what happened is that she was deliberately put there to change that, that little subculture that was really the, the cancer in the organization. And over a period of time, the leader of the organization supported her in her efforts of really having to deal with that. And uh, it really worked itself out. So those people did not change, but they did end up leaving the organization, some by choice and some otherwise. So don't run from everything because it's uncomfortable. And then you can have leadership that comes in and they make a change. And if you run too fast, you'll never see the good things in the organization. Change isn't bad all the time. Change can be good. So I would say just stick it out and 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 look at what's going on. Don't take don't take the 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 hit the road mode first. Yeah, and I think also you can actually surprise them. I mean, it's it's funny. I'm sure like you both uh, can attest to this. When you reach a certain age and look back, you'd see like so many things you thought were such big deals really weren't. And if you had just given them time, they would have resolved themselves, right? Um, so not everything actually requires an action. I think they're also, and uh, you know, there's an element of like having some kind of discernment to know that, you know, if I wait the situation out, it's going to be fine, right? And just focus on my goals and why I'm here. I know this, this role is important to what I'm trying to do with my career. The job I'm doing here is really important to where I'm trying to go. Uh, so don't let those sort of like immediate issues or distractions um, hinder you, you know, having to, because it's not easy also to like look for another job, go start somewhere else try to get, you know, get into a new culture. I mean, that stuff takes time as well. So there's sometimes that you can just wait out the not so great stuff, even if you can't do anything about it. And I'll say that I wish I had the access point when I was going through. <laughs> I mean, I, I made huge mistakes like that. Everything was a big deal at some times, you know, yeah. for me, it, I made mistakes. Especially when you're growing in your career and it's early and things are moving well, you've got momentum and you're getting recognition, that can be difficult. So I think we're, we're getting into this. The things that we're talking about are leading to this or leading us to this next piece. There is a study in the journal Volunteer, Volunteer, Voluntary Sector Review. So not necessarily about corporate stuff, but I think definitely some interesting work about how to help people reinvent themselves and so when they did this work with people who were volunteering organizations what they found was that reinventing self requires these three things this was a study this year february 2022 creating space for agency and self-work an environment that activates the capacity for agency and growth and that the people who are looking to do the reinvention have to situate themselves in a wider relational and social context. I think that's a good list. 
Are there other things we need to consider if you're going to do this work? Yeah, I think that's actually, that's, that's a pretty good list, actually. Um, I would say also not being afraid to fail, like try things that you're not comfortable with. Um, because, so if you're trying to do something new, a lot of times I think, especially for minorities, you, you know, you, you don't want to be seen as incompetent. So we're not usually the first to raise our hand to do something. We're not, com- com- you know, confident that we can do really well. That's because um, the penalties are so great. Yeah. Fair enough. That's true. Uh, but I do think back to like the sponsorship, that's where things like that are important, right? Absolutely. Because if you have the, you know, the right backing or you have like people in the organization that you feel comfortable with as individuals, then you can, you can volunteer to do stuff on their teams. Right. And they know it's because you're trying to learn a new skill or you're trying to do something else um, because you only learn by actually doing a lot of times we do this and I've, I've done this, you know, we, we take all the courses and we take, you know, sometimes go and get a new degree just because I want to learn this one thing when you could have actually just like tried it out. Right. Um, and so I, I think I think you're absolutely right. I know like sometimes the price of failure is high, but finding ha- building those relationships where you feel safe so that you can actually try new things and it's like you know it's okay to make mistakes. And you mentioned volunteering. I think that's another place to try things, like volunteering in organizations um that do what you're interested in and trying your hands at things there. But I do think there's something about like being able to um, try new things and being okay with making mistakes, finding places where it's okay to make mistakes. I love it. So, so far we've got a long list of incredible things to do at every level. What we've said when it comes to reinventing yourself and this notion of quiet quitting on the today's you, so you can move into the next phase for yourself. We said for employees, we want to make sure that you spend some time getting to know who you are. What are you reinventing? Do the work to understand self. What are your core values? What makes a good life? What does success look like? You don't need to put so much pressure on the organization, right? That's not the organization's responsibility. They play a role, but it's not fully that responsibility. Have some agency to have complete control over your life and what are all the missing, the moving pieces look like together. Maximize organizational change and transition as opportunities to thrive. Be cautious about being positive. Authenticity might be the better approach than 100% positivity. Have a, but have a positive outlook. Doesn't mean that every day has to be awesome. Be intentional. Identify sponsors. Find your North Star and figure out where your shining points are. Recognize that everything is not for everybody. Imagine ways that you can grow. Find your cycle for reinvention. Like Max says, is it every seven years we start questioning? So you can be more familiar with that and you can get ready and prepare for those ebbs and flows. Look inside to reconcile the issues that you may be having on the outside and identify why am I feeling this way? Remember that not everything requires an action or a reaction, and don't be afraid to fail. What we've said about managers and supervisors is that you've got to help people find their tribe. Where do you thrive? How do you work well? Who are the people that help bring the best out of you? We've got to help people identify ways to grow. We have to help people remove labels So they don't label things as bad and toxic so that they can see opportunities where there may be challenges and also help people. And I love this one. This is my favorite one for tonight. Help people establish realistic expectations of the workplace and their specific role for organizations. Know your role, that it is okay to run the business how you see fit. Give employees agency over their lives and their careers. Make sure or make decisions that are based on what is best for the company and for the business. Recognize that organizational change is a great opportunity for employees to reassess their roles and maybe their purpose. Support them in that exploration. Understand that every organization is not for everyone. And Max, you said, hey, I'm already helping people identify this not the place for you. How do I get you to a new place? And recognize that there are structural barriers that prevent people from reaching their full potential. 
So if we take all of that into consideration, all of the nuggets and gems that we've dropped tonight, we know that there is this. And Dr. Wendy, you mentioned this a little bit earlier. We know there's always a black and brown tax. So if you are not heeding this advice, all the things we've discussed today that we're bringing forth from our own careers, our own experiences, and our engagement with people in organizations and, and in business, if you don't listen to these things, what's the tax that we pay? What's, what's the price you pay for not heeding this advice? Max. Uh, I think you're going to spend a lot of energy fighting battles that are not worth fighting. Come on now. <laughs> Tell the people. Yeah, I think that's it. I think you just, you know, if you have an understanding of everything we've just gone through, um, then then you, you will be able to navigate, you know, yourself within the context of work much easier. Um, and it will save you a lot of cycles in, you know, having conversations that are not necessary or having conflicts that are not necessary. I love it. Dr. Wendy. I would say not to be reflexive not a knee-jerk reflex because of everything that goes on in an organization know thyself Mm -hmm. and if joy is what you want to maintain and you know what that is for you then you know the direction that you want to take in your career it is not up to your job it is not up to the organization it's all about you thank you so much i'll tell you what i think if you aren't listening to this laundry list of things that we just shelled out here about how to manage this and how to think about quitting, quiet quitting the, the today's you for reinvention, you run the risk of becoming that toxic person in the organization. The Ooh. person who is not taking advantage of opportunities, the person who seems to hate everything that happens and everybody with whom they come in contact, the person who can't seem to get along with everyone, the person that nobody wants to work with, the person that people leave out of meetings and offer emails and every time they contact you, they got to CC somebody else. That might be you. So mm. Take it easy. Keep those things in mind. As always, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you so much, Max. Pence, I appreciate your knowledge, your expertise, your energy. Yeah. You got some gems on me tonight. I'm about to go yes. this list over. Thank you so much, Dr. Wendy. It is always a pleasure co-hosting with you. Yeah, Everybody indeed. else out there, thank you for joining us as always. If you want to continue to connect with Living Corporate, here are all of our socials on the web. We are livingcorporate.tv. On Twitter, we are at Living Corporate. LinkedIn, we are Living Corporate. Instagram at Living Corporate. And wherever you get your podcasts, you can find us. Good night from the Access Point, everybody. Awesome. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Living Corporate is brought to you by Textio. Today's top talent is everywhere, representing everyone. And our work environment should reflect the level of inclusion to meet that standard. Textio achieves this in building more equitable company cultures through the language we use in our job postings. That culture is formed one hire at a time making the words we use to reach more diverse candidates all the more important. Our advanced language insights and employer brand content is what drives our mission of inclusion. Through our industry-leading application of artificial intelligence and machine learning, we're able to widen companies' reach in finding and building upon the very diverse talent that empowers a culture of belonging. Every door should be open to every qualified job seeker. Again, that's Textio.